In the Bible, we see countless warnings about avoiding sinful passions. And instead, we should pursue a life of holiness. We can find that everywhere in the Bible. So the question is, why is this so? I mean, if God is truly a gracious God, why won't he just save us with no strings attached? Like, no conditions, or why, not, why wouldn't he just live us the way we want to live? All right? So that's the kind of question that I would like to give an answer to. And now we know that as believers, we are called to be ambassadors of Christ, representatives of God, because the, the unbelieving world is watching. So, what do we do when people say bad things, especially lies about us? How do we respond to criticism or, better yet, persecution? Let's be on our feet as we read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Heavenly Father, you are holy. And because you are holy, you hate sin, and you will never tolerate sin. And we, as your people, are called to live a life that is pleasing to you. In the midst of this unbelieving world. So we pray as we study these two verses, as we open our hearts Move and show us the lessons. And if there's anything that we need to adjust or change, give us the power to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. Thank you. I want to call this message Fleshly Living versus Godly Living. A quick background or a review of the things we learned last week. First, Christians are a chosen race, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, and the people belonging to God. Basically, that's those four descriptions are, they give us a vivid picture of what the church should look like. And second, Christians are tasked to promote and celebrate God's goodness. We are, I think we're doing a good job in celebrating God's goodness, but more than the celebration part, we also need to excel in promoting God's goodness. And VBS is one of those things. All right, so the sermon will be divided into two parts, beginning with uh, verse 11. And let's talk about conflicting desires. All right, let's unpack the passage. This section in 1 Peter 2 talks about believers' conduct in a pagan world. When we say pagan, basically that means a world that does not obey God. In a nutshell, that's how I would put it. Now, the Apostle Peter here reminds his readers of two important things. First, he addresses them as beloved. And that's an amazing, amazing term to use which comes from the Greek word agapetos, which means dear and worthy of love. Now, this is, this is important because Peter is writing to a persecuted people. People who were, who were arrested, who were beaten, and some of them killed because they were Christians. Beloved would be the last word that they would think 
to define themselves. But now the Apostle Peter is saying, you are beloved. Second, he calls them sojourners and exiles, which brings us back to what he said in chapter 1, reminding them of the temporary nature of their stay on earth. Like, maybe some of the people were thinking, why aren't we treated the same way the Romans are treated? And by calling them sojourners and exiles, Peter is saying, because this is not your home. You are beloved by God, and yet you are sojourners, pilgrims of the earth. How are they sojourners? In the sense that they're living in a land that, one, that doesn't belong to them, and two, they don't have any rights as citizens. They were exiles in the sense that their earthly stay is temporary, and one day it will come to an end. And more importantly, they are exiles because heaven is their permanent home. How many of you here, you are, you are just grateful that you can call heaven your home? Say amen. By doing so, Peter connects the believers of the diaspora's situation to Abraham's situation back in the book of Genesis, where God calls Abraham to live in a foreign land. He had first to leave his family, everything he had known all his life, and move to a place that he never knew and practically start his family there. So I want you to notice how Peter lovingly speaks to them. Take note, Peter is probably the leader of the apostles. No wonder why a certain portion of John 21 shows us Jesus telling Peter to feed his sheep, feed his lamb, three times. But look at how, how gentle he is. He is asking them. He is urging them. Now, the Greek word used here, parakaleo, it means to call one side. It means to beg. It kind of reminds me of how Paul uh, worded Romans chapter 12. I encourage you. I entreat you. I ask you. I beg you. That kind of gives us an idea of how, how we should relate to one another when we uh, are asking favors from one another. We should, we should be nice. We should be gentle. Now, he mentioned the term passions a second time. The first time he did was in, first, in the first chapter, verse 17. What does it mean? Passions. It refers to, to craving for what is forbidden. In other words, it's lust. Peter urges them to avoid the temporary pleasures of, of physical, sinful desires because doing so prohibits them from desiring a holy life. The whole idea of Peter's exhortation here is for the dispersed believers to remind themselves that because of their status as foreigners, they have to behave in such a way that no one could accuse them of wrongdoing. You know, when I was filing our application for immigration here so that I could, I could bring my family here, um, there's a certain portion in the application that says, uh, I promise to obey all the laws of Canada and not doing so would, would result in me going back home, being sent back home. So I got to watch my behavior, otherwise, bye-bye. <laughs> That's kind of how I would illustrate Peter's point here. Remember, you're pilgrims, you're exiles, you're sojourners, so behave well. 
so that when there's anyone trying to, to spew ma malicious things about you guys, you don't have to be worried because they cannot substantiate their claims. Your upright behavior will disprove them. Because the church back then was under fire, believers couldn't allow their accusers to justify their persecution against believers. And the only way for believers to prove their critics wrong was through their behavior. Leading me to my first point, freshly living damages a believer's testimony. The Bible is replete with, with admonitions to flee sinful desires. We see that word a lot, especially in Paul's epistles. Since we have already been rescued from a life of filth, there is no reason for us to continue nursing our fleshly desires. Now, when we hear the word fleshly, for the most part, we think about sexual sins. As a matter of fact, we can use the word flesh as a synonym for, for the word sin. Maybe because that's the kind of sin that is so difficult to overcome. But the thing is, in the New, in, in the new Testament, the word fleshly has a wider application. I mean, not only does it refer to sensual, sexual, immoral sins, but also anything that goes against the will of God. Meaning, fleshly desires are selfish, they are uncontrollable desires that wage war against the human soul and against the will of God. Those are fleshly passions. Let's put it in a little bit more practical way. We can justify eating, especially after working for hours and hours, but excessive eating qualifies you as a glutton unless you have an eating disorder. Or maybe that's because you have. That's why you have an eating disorder to begin with. And it is all right to sleep six, seven, eight hours a day. But if you have a practice of sleeping 16 hours a day, you know that there's something wrong. There's some excessive thing going on there. Right? And it's okay to express our emotions especially if they're valid. But if we are irritable, if we are temperamental, it, not only does it raise our blood pressures, but it also drives people away. You know, yesterday I, I posted a video about the job of a pastor. And somebody commented and asked me, what will I do if my pastor is so irritable and uh, he's always angry. I said, well, how are you as a church member? No, not really. I, I, said, <laughs> I said, you should probably talk to him. Maybe he's going through something difficult. And, he, and his, uh, his um, conduct is just the result of what he's going through, right? And... That, that said, a pastor has always, we have to be friendly. We have to be approachable. Because, you know, uh, people don't really like coming up to or, or approaching people in, in authority. Let alone preachers. <laughs> Therefore, we should, we should all the more exert effort to be friendly and approachable. And if there's anybody in this place who thinks that I'm not very friendly, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, we can talk. You'll have your coffee, I'll have my water, we'll, we'll do fine. All right, so question is, how do we control our sinful desires? We actually read it earlier. It's found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. 
But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. There you go. We have to walk by. Take note of the preposition. By the Spirit. When you say by, you're, you're close. There's a sense of intimacy and, and personal in that word. So there should be an intimate, personal relationship between, between you and the Holy Spirit. Listen. Desire in and of itself is neutral. It's neither evil nor good. It's the object that defines the outcome of desire. Therefore, what we run after will tell whether or not we go with the will of God. We can control our sinful desires by putting ourselves under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We studied that when, when we were in Ephesians chapter 5, when we talked about being Spirit-filled, being controlled by the Spirit. As we pursue to know God more, we find ourselves having no time to crave fleshly desires. We only have 24 hours a day. Now it's up to us what to run after. Where do we spend the most of our time? If we tend to have a lot of free time, where do we spend that? Our choices determine uh, the outcome. Our choices will shape the kind of heart that we will have. As believers, we... We should find our satisfaction in God himself. Therefore, when we try to seek pleasures other than what God provides, our souls, our souls become deprived of the life that comes from God. I understand that the, the fight against evil is an uphill battle. Like trying to ride your bike up on the beaten while suffering asthma. Therefore, what I'm trying to say is we will always be faced with, with choices. We'll always have to make choices. We will always battle with evil. As long as we are here in these bodies, in this world, temptations will always be there. Therefore, the likelihood of falling into sin will always be there. And because we are resident aliens, we will never feel at home in this world. Brace yourselves because the world is about to get more weird. So maybe it's a good thing not to ex spend too much time on social media. Because it's getting more weird. The philosophy of human beings, especially in developed countries in the Western world, you know, as technology progresses, the mind shrinks. That's how I see it. What does the Bible say? For the wisdom of man is foolishness. By comparison, the Bible is saying the foolishness of God is much greater than the wisdom of man. So if we, we spend our energy and time and resources trying to learn about the ways of the world, it's not, it's not a distant, it wouldn't be wrong to conclude that we will be moving further and further away from God. So let's make a wise choice. Let's pursue the Savior. Verse 12, silencing critics. Now we can see here, the first word is, is kind of forceful. In, in biblical interpretation, you would call that an imperative. It means you should pay attention to active verbs. 
Peter is telling here, telling us here to live God honoring lives in a godless society. Now he uses the term honorable. That's how he illustrates or or uh, describes the kind of life that they should be living. Other translations render it as excellent. It describes something beautiful because of cleanliness of heart and soul. It refers to moral purity. In other words, Peter is telling the people here to maintain a good reputation among pagans. Why? Why is reputation such a big deal? Reputation was a serious matter in the first century. In fact, a bad reputation eliminated any opportunities in a person's life. A, bad, a person with a bad reputation would find it really hard to land a job or start a business or keep a business. Since early Christians were deprived, already persecuted, they had to demonstrate a lifestyle of righteousness. But despite their honorable lives, history tells us that Christians of the diaspora were constantly persecuted. In fact, when, whenever there was a natural disaster, maybe an earthquake or a, maybe a volcanic eruption, people would automatically blame the Christians for it. They were also accused of being disloyal to the emperor. You can find that in John 19, 12. They were also accused of disturbing people's businesses, of being reclusive because they avoided vices and refused to participate in pagan festivities. Moreover, they were labeled as atheists because they refused to worship the emperor or idols. You see, they, they were just trying to do what is right, and yet they are constantly being judged, being called names. But why, why suffer this? And why, why give them encouragement? Peter gives them two reasons. One, their good works and clean lives will protect them against false accusations. The word see, let me read that again in verse 12, that they may, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Now that's very important because the word see is not a simple glance. In the original language, it's not just a simple glance. Now, that word means Careful watching over some time. Have you ever done bird watching? Like you don't want to let, you don't want to lose that bird on the frame, right? In the frame. You want that to be there in the rect rectangular or binoculars, it's circle anyway. I'm, you don't want the bird to go. You just, don't, you just don't take a glance. You stare, you watch closely. That's what the word means. What Peter is trying to say here is that there should be consistency and a sense of permanence in their upright conduct. He's telling them to maintain a life of purity and usefulness. Be pure. Be useful. Yeah, people don't really have much to say against you if you are a contributor to society. That's why Christians, we are the, the foremost religion that had put up the most hospitals, care homes, and whenever calamity strikes, Christian groups are always the first to respond. Second, the critics will glorify God in the future. Take note of that. From persecution to glorification. That's the idea of permanence, of consistency. When you're consistently doing the will of God, it's only a matter of time. 
before people will change their mind about God and you. The Greek term can be understood as believe in God. So they, not only will they glorify God, but they will also believe in God. It describes a changing of mind or a reversal, a reversal of opinion. Not only will they silence their critics, but they will also cause them to change their minds about God and Christians. Now he mentions a rather interesting term, the day of of visitation. It seems to mean the coming of the Lord Jesus, either in grace for unbelievers, for believers, and judgment for unbelievers. This day would mean salvation for those who receive God's grace and judgment for those who refuse it. Last point for today. Godly living is the most effective form of evangelism. If you agree with that statement, say, Amen. Amen. Criticism is almost a certainty for us, for Christians. Because we are following a God who wants his people to be different, to be holy, will always be at odds with the world. And because we will not participate in the world's ungodly activities, they will likely resent us for standing our ground. Somebody told me that he is being made fun of because he he wouldn't join them in their nasty jokes illicit, dirty jokes. Just because of that, they would make fun of him. So let's not be surprised when we are being persecuted or mocked, when we say what is true, when we do what is right, that's bound to happen. In fact, Paul reminds us that persecution is part of our calling. If you're living the life of a Christian, prepare to be persecuted. But if you claim to be a Christian and yet no one persecutes you, ask yourself, why am I not persecuted? Maybe I'm doing a good job of blending with the world. But despite the people's persecution, we cannot fight fire with fire. We just can't. Instead, our obedience to God should serve as an agent to extinguish the flames. Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Did you notice our cross-references? They're both 5, 16, coming from different books, two books. Friends, let's not forget that the people who are attacking us are the very same people that we are sent to evangelize. They're the ones that we ought to be winning for Christ. Let's not forget that. When our arguments get heated, when disagreements have become the norm, when you talk to your relatives and friends, remember, in the back of your head, remember, you are God's ambassador. You're not there to win an argument. You're there to win a soul for Jesus. The Bible's telling us that the way to win people for Christ is not by tolerance or association, but by living God-honoring lives in the midst of a pagan world. That's the gist of what Jesus said, basically, in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Live as God's people. So our goal is not just to silence our critics. That's easy. Just sound smart. Even if you don't know what you're talking about, you'll win the argument. Believe me. Just sound smart. Use big words and they will shut up. But that's not the point. The point is not to silence our critics. The point is to show them that the truth is absolute and that there is one God 
one true God who loves them, who made a way for them to be forgiven of their sins and given eternal life. That is the point. They got to know that this God whom we are serving is not just the God who punishes. It's also a God who saves. More importantly, he is also a God who changes life. He changes lives. Therefore, when we hear people trying to discredit us, saying all kinds of bad things about us, let's not be deterred. Let's not be shaken. We must continue to live Christ-honoring lives, lives pleasing to God, even when it's hard. And when the time is right, who knows? Who knows? Our testimony just might spark the change in their minds that could ultimately lead to the salvation of their souls. I've said a lot. That's about 2,300 words. Minus the illustrations. But if there's one thing that I would like you to take home today, is this. Be patient. They said it. As they say, Christianity is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And so is our testimony. We build it over years and years of patience. Let's not lose hope. Even when we're on the verge of giving in, let's resist evil. And may God give us the strength to do so. Let's pray.